This video is published under the Creative Commons license BY and CSA, which means attribution, non-commercial and share-alike. Third-party material has been used for which the permission is specified explicitly for every diagram, photograph or whatever has been used. Please mention the author as Andreas Pfennig, Products, Environment and Processes, Department of Chemical Engineering, Université de Liège, Belgium. A disclaimer applies. Welcome to this video on the salt influence on interfaces. In this first video of this series, I would like to show you something about the electrostatic potential difference, where it's coming from mainly, and then in the following videos we will discuss the consequences of that. I would like to start out with a short motivation. That relates to phase separation, which is a quite frequent unit operation in, the, uh, in chemical engineering. The next slide shows in principle how that can be characterized. Uh, to the left you see the experiment. There is a beaker which is filled with a liquid-liquid dispersion. So one phase is dispersed in the other phase, so droplet phase and continuous phase, dispersed phase and continuous phase. And you see after a certain time the lower limit, so to speak, where a clear phase or has already been formed up here as well. So it takes some time until the phase separation occurs, depending on a variety of influencing parameters. Of course the physical properties, but as you will realize later, also the electrostatics of the interfaces. You see, take some time and you can record actually this level as a function of time and that gives you this level, this height as a function of time, gives you the sedimentation curve and this top level, so to speak, gives the coalescence curve. After a certain time, these two lines meet at a certain point, so that means there's a clear interface that has been produced, which is the so-called settling time. Details of that, how that works, will be worked out in the uh, chapter on designing such a settler because one can also distinguish between the sedimentation zone and a zone where the droplets are sitting on top of each other in the so-called closed back dispersion, but that is not relevant in this context. But this shows in principle how the separation, the coalescence behavior, can in principle be characterized. So this experiment is performed and you can evaluate that and you can evaluate it quantitatively and even predict the settler behavior based on that. Now I want to show you something about the salt influence because that's a big chapter heading, so to speak, the headline of the entire chapter. And in order to show that, these are three videos where the salt amount has been varied. And you see actually the same experiment here after some seconds everything is done. Here it takes somewhat longer, so 12 seconds. Here it takes 35 seconds. One should say there is a speed up or a time lapse factor of two in these cases. And this central video, it has been actually speeded up by a factor of 15. Nevertheless, the behavior is much smaller than with these two systems. The physical system is identical, but the amount of salt has been varied from very low, some intermediate value and some high value. And there you realize that in this case, the settling time is more than 1000 seconds, so more than 20 minutes, as compared to oh, around 20 minutes, where this is at most 35 seconds. So salts have an extremely strong influence on the settling behavior. I should say that the concentrations here are extremely low. They are in the range of some 10 millimoles per liter of the aqueous phase. In, in this case where you have this, observe this. You can quantify this, you can plot the settling time as a function of salt concentration. And this has been done by Karl Beusch in a student thesis. He has investigated that many years ago, 20 years ago uh, roughly, uh, for the butanol water system where the water phase is the dispersed phase in that case. So there is an excess of butanol phase and the small amount of water phase, phase ratio organic to aqueous is 5 to 2. And then salt has been added to the system. And we see that for low concentrations of salt, two salts or different salts, Sodium bromide and sodium chloride have been added and we see that for a low salt concentration or even no salt concentration, the settling time is around 20 seconds. So this is around 20 seconds, a little bit more than 20 seconds. Then as we add salt at a certain concentration, the um, settling time increases dramatically. And this is still in the range of some 10 to 100 millimoles per liter of the aqueous phase. Actually what is plotted here, it's the same for the butanol phase. The concentration 
I don't know why that has been plotted for the b2 null phase. Actually, one would plot it in the aqueous phase. The partition coefficient is of the order of 100, so the concentration is higher by a factor of roughly 100, so that around here we are of the order of 100 millimoles per liter at this, this maximum, which is still an extremely low concentration. Uh, so 100 millimoles, so a tenth of a mole. Set, it means some grams per liter, which is not a very high concentration. It doesn't change the physical properties realizably. Beyond that, you get certain shifts in equilibrium, but at least concentration, not yet. Oh, very small cost shifts. Um, and you see that the settling behavior increases, the settling time increases by a factor of 1000. So in this range, it takes of the order of one day for the phase separation, whereas here it was 20 seconds. Beyond a certain concentration, then the settling time decreases and in this case actually for the sodium bromide the settling time is less than it was without the salt and one can show actually if one analyzes that that in this case the drops as soon as they reach or they come close to the major interface they directly coalesce no close packed zone form that are called droplets directly coalesce so that's what we observe in this case the, the interesting thing is that actually for the two salts, the increase in settling times appears to occur at slightly shifted concentrations. The decrease occurs at more or less identical concentration. And also the level is slightly different. So there is a difference between the salts and the salts have a strong influence on this coalescence behavior. And well, I propose, and we will see in uh, some videos ahead, we will see that actually the um, electrostatic potential difference between the phases is the cause or is one of the causes for this behavior. Now in order to understand the origin of this interfacial potential difference uh, I would like to introduce a special system that well actually we will see in the end potential differences occur for all interfaces but in this case the understanding will be uh, most uh, easy to access and what we want to look at is an so-called aqueous two-phase system. An aqueous two-phase system contains mostly of water and in this case two polymers. The polymers are polyethylene glycol with a molar mass of 1500 and dextran with a, a molar mass of 500,000 grams per mole. The rest is water. And actually you see we, see we have a zoom in, so this is our alternative diagram with the binodal and the tie lines, and it's a zoom in to the water corner. So all this here is rich in water. Yeah? So here's the line of 80% water. So we have of the order of 70 to 80% water in both of our phases. And we see that one of the phases is enriched in polyethylene glycol, but contains only little dextran. And the other phase, the other equilibrium phase, contains around 20-30% of dextran, but only 5 or so percent of the polyethylene glycol. So there we have a two-phase system. Both phases contain as a majority water. And of course, if we add salts to such a system, they will dissociate. And that's what it makes so easy. It's not an aqueous organic system, where in one phase you can debate if the salts are dissociating. We don't need to discuss that. Both phase are, phases are aqueous. Both phases, if we add a salt, lead to the dissociation of the salts. So we have ionic species present in both of the phases. In, and if we take strong salts, then actually it will be more or less completely dissociated. Now, if we add a salt to a two-phase system, what happens? As I said, they dissociate. And if we look at that, it looks somewhat like that. So we have our for example, sodium chloride that we want to add, we have our two-phase system, our beaker, so to speak, with the two phases, and in between, uh, we add the two salts, uh, the, the salt, and that dissociates into the two ions. Now, apparently, that means at the same time that we now have two species, and in principle, they can behave independently because they are just like ordinary other species that we add to a system, a two-phase system. We will have partition coefficients that can, in principle, be different between the sodium and the chloride ions. In principle, I mean, we will see later how that works out in detail. And in order to understand the consequences that that can happen in principle, let's have a look at some physical equations. And I would like to start out with the so-called Poisson equation. The Poisson equation relates the phi, which is the electrostatic potential, 
to the rho z, which is the so-called net charge density, divided by the electro, uh, dielectric properties of the system, epsilon zero being the dielectric constant of vacuum, and epsilon r is the relative dielectric um, value for the corresponding phase. So this characterizes the dielectric properties. And the net charge density is actually characterized like this. It is a summation over all ions, okay, so all ionic species, their concentration, the charge number of the ions, and the Faraday constant. Faraday constant characterizing the Coulomb, the charges per mole. So it's the molar equivalent to the elementary charge. It's just the elementary charge times the Avogadro's constant. And that means that this high number shows up in here. So we see that if at a certain place the concentrations, in this case of sodium and chloride, would be identical, they would have opposite charges, the summation or their, their individual concentration and the charges would just cancel. So if the concentrations are identical, the net charge density is zero. And of course, if some ionic species carry two or minus two charges, that is accounted for appropriately. So if that is always matching, then that is exactly zero. If there is a preferential tendency of the sodium to partition into the top phase, it means that this value will have a slightly positive excess, meaning that this has a slightly positive value as well. And now I have to integrate to obtain the electrical, electrostatic potential. So integrate, I can have to start somewhere. I can start, for example, at the interface, and it will realize, so the nabla squared of the electrostatic potential is minus this non-zero charge density in case we have a partitioning of the, so the sodium ions into the top phase, which means that we have, if we integrate twice, uh, first integrate once, so we have a integrate once to get the nabla phi. That means that we have a linear increase of this nabla phi. And if we integrate the second time, we have a quadratic increase as a function of distance from the interface. Now, what does that mean? For that, we can look at this equation that describes the force acting on a charge brought into an electrical field. Now, this is a, a vector properties. Everything is in this direction. So we are looking, so to speak, in this direction, more or less. And then we can evaluate actually the, uh, the, pot uh, the, the uh, potential being um, the nabla of the phi. We realize that this nabla of phi increases linearly as a function of distance. And if you evaluate that, mainly because, or for one reason, because this Faraday uh, constant has such a high value, actually the force is acting on the charge in this electrical field increases quite or will become quite strong as a function of distance. So there will be strong forces acting on the ionic species. And actually, if you evaluate that, I mean, if you would have a beaker, so to speak, with um, an excess, so if you would separate this top phase and have it in a beaker, then actually the ionics, the, the, if it's positively charged, so to speak, the forces, the repellent, uh, repulsive forces between all the positive ions would be so strong, the system would just blow up. And the forces are really strong. On the other hand side, I mean, in this case, it leads to the sodium ions being pulled downward in the direction of the chloride ion, and also this other way around, of course, the chloride ions being pulled towards the sodium ion. So this picture, where we have a different separation, different partitioning of the sodium on the chloride ion for bulk phases at, loss, at least cannot be. Because of that, because systems would blow up if there is a slight excess charge, the only consequence can be that this net charge density is exactly zero for equilibrium phases, bulk equilibrium phases, and only then this uh, electrostatic potential will not increase beyond any limits. So only that, that way this value keeps, uh, remains small and the forces are manageable. This requirement that bulk phases in equilibrium have a net charge density of zero is typically called the electroneutrality condition. So bulk phases in equilibrium have to be electroneutral. If you should ever observe a phase which has a slight excess charge, it will blow up directly because of the extremely strong forces. Now actually, um, so we realize that this picture is wrong, but what is then the correct picture? And the correct picture is shown here. So that doesn't work. 
In reality, both of the ions have to agree somehow how they want to partition between the phases and they have to come up with the identical partition coefficient. Nevertheless, so to speak, both ionic species still feel somehow that they would like to partition independently. So they feel their, well, uh, their original partition behavior and that leads actually to the so-called electrostatic potential difference. Now here I only expressed it rather vaguely in a, with some, uh, so that you can understand it. And now we want to derive exactly that more systematically, more rigidly, based on solid grounds, based on solid thermodynamic considerations. Well, for that I would like to uh, switch to, the, um, uh, to, to my notes. Let me just this. So we want to look at uh, deriving, so to speak, equations that describe exa exactly that. And we will see in the end what I mentioned here, so to speak, in a rather visual way, can be found exactly that way in the equations. First of all, let's start out with a typical thermodynamic equilibrium. So if we have a typical thermodynamic equilibrium, how does that look like? Come on, what's going on here? And we know that in thermodynamic equilibrium, of course, the pressure in both phases has to be identical, the temperature has to be identical, and the chemical potential has to be identical. So the chemical potential, Ui, in one phase, which I want to indicate by a prime, has to be identical to the chemical potential of the other phase. So the mu I being the chemical potential. which is identical for each component, it's identical in both phases. So it can be different for different components, but for each component it's the same in all phases in equilibrium. And we also know how to describe the chemical potential. It can be described in the following way. The mu i can be realized as some reference value, depending if you work with equations of state of GE models, that may be slightly different. Um, your component at system conditions, for example, and then we know that it is plus RT times the logarithm of the so-called activity. So here AI is the activity of component I, of course. And we know that we can spell that out further. The activity can be split in typically mole fraction, but in principle you can use any other concentration measure and the activity coefficient. So we can even rewrite that UI equals ui0 plus rt ln gamma i xi. And the gamma i in this context is the activity coefficient. Of course, you have to specify the reference state, so you define, how so to speak, your mu i0. And as I said, this xi in this case is the mole fraction because that's thermodynamically the most natural concentration coordinate that you can apply because molecules interact and because of that mole fractions make sense in this case. But in principle, you are free to choose any other uh, concentration measure in principle, only you have to do it consistently with all the equations that you apply. And now we can actually apply this equation or plug this equation into this one here. If we do that, what do we obtain? Where well, we realize, if we substitute that, that the mu i0, well, let me first write it down, plus rt ln gamma i prime x i prime. And you see, I don't prime the temperature. I also don't prime the reference state. So what we assume is that the reference state is the same for both phases, as is quite not natural. And we already mentioned that the temperature is the same in all phases in equilibrium anyway, so that's the same in equilibrium also. No prime required. Equals the same for the other phase, mu i0 plus rt. Uh, logarithm of the gamma i double prime, x i double prime. 
And we realize directly that, of course, the reference state will cancel. We can divide by the RT. And then we wind up with a typical equation that we have at the, uh, that you know from chemical engineering thermodynamics, that the gamma I prime Xi prime equals gamma I double prime Xi double prime. So that describes liquid-liquid equilibria, for example, and you can, can apply, for example, excess Gibbs energy models to describe the activity coefficient, the gamma, as a function of X and T, and you can use that to uh, calculate liquid-liquid equilibria. In this case, we don't want to go that far into modeling, but instead we want to describe the partition coefficient. The partition coefficient Ki is defined as the Xi prime divided by Xi double prime. So it's the concentration ratio of a component between two phases. And we realize that that is apparently gamma I double prime divided by gamma I prime. So that is the partition coefficient. So Ki is the partition coefficient. Okay, so far so good. This all relates to components which are not charged, where we do not take, need to take charges into account. As soon as charges play a role, as soon as we have a charge carrying species in our system, we have to extend our equilibrium considerations and take this charged species explicitly into account in the interaction, in the electrostatic interactions. In order to do that, one typically defines, or one can define, or one has to define actually, the electrochemical potential. We want to introduce that as a mu i tilde, which is now the electrochemical potential. In equilibrium now, the electrochemical potential of any species has to be identical. So the mu i tilde prime has to be mu i tilde double prime. That replaces the simple thermodynamic equilibrium for the uh, uncharged species. Now the question is, of course, well, how to determine this electrochemical potential? For that, we have we have to extend, so to speak, the chemical potential, and we can rewrite that the mu i tilde equals the mu i plus, and now we have to add some electrostatic stuff, so to speak. So the charges are interacting apparently now with this electrostatic potential that we have for a given phase. And if you want to write that correspondingly, that is the charge number zi times the Faraday constant that we know already, that was present on the previous slide, times the corresponding potential phi of that phase in which the ions are, are present. So that gives an additional contribution. And now we can substitute this equation into this, at the same time replace the mu i by what we have seen before. And of course we now have to realize that the potential, the electrostatic potential, can be different between the phases. Faraday constant does not depend, and if the salts are completely uh, dissociated, then also the Zi will not differ for the two phases, so, uh, well, or generally will not differ for the two phases. So we can now substitute that into this equation and plug everything in. If we do that, we obtain the mu i can be replaced by the mu i0 plus rt ln gamma i prime x i prime plus z i f phi prime. The same for the second phase. So we first replace the mu i, which is a mu i zero plus r t log of gamma i double prime x i double prime plus the second term, this electrostatic term, z i f, which is unchanged, which is the same for both phases, times the phi double prime. And now we can play with that equation a little bit and realize what actually happens. Yeah, so we can sort that out again. And um, well, what do we have? Again, our chemical potentials of the reference state, they cancel, so that is the same as that. Okay, we cannot divide by RT, but we can divide by RT, we will actually do that. And what we then obtain, let me do that step in between, 
we get that we have the logarithm gamma i prime x i prime plus z i f over r t times the electrostatic potential of that phase equals the logarithm of gamma i double prime x i double prime plus the same z i f over r t of the electrostatic potential of the other phase, the phi double prime. And now we can sort that a little bit, and especially we want to solve it in the end, actually, for, again for the partition coefficient, which is again the ratio between uh, x i prime and x i double prime, and it's easier to write that in a logarithmic form. How does that look like? So if we want to spell out, so to speak, the logarithm of x i prime divided by x i double prime, which is the ln ki equals. So actually this has been brought to the other side and then we have to bring this to the other side as well. So what we obtain first is this logarithm ratio again. So it's logarithm of gamma i double prime divided by gamma i prime. Same as before more or less. But then we have this additional term that we have here. Uh, and let me write it with a minus sign. Uh, the prefactor is the zif over rt and with a minus sign it is actually phi prime minus phi double prime. And now we can introduce some shorthand notation because we can realize that this ratio of the activity coefficient is the same as the components would have if they were not charged. So actually that corresponds to the partition coefficient of component i if it were not charged. It's a hypothetical value, has, you cannot measure it, but in principle it corresponds to that partition coefficient that that species would have if it were not uh, carrying a charge. Which means it has all interactions with the surrounding water, for example, all the orientations and polar and whatever interactions taking place, but you don't account for that species having a charge and the charge interacting with the electrostatic potential of that phase. That interaction is excluded. So we can use as a shorthand notation thus a Ki0 for example, that's how it's defined, is just or logarithm of that is of course the gamma i double prime divided by the gamma i prime. At the same time, we can define a delta phi, potential difference, that was the title of the lecture anyway. It's a phi prime minus a phi double prime. And then we come up, so to speak, with the final equation where we can say the ln ki equals the ln ki zero minus zi f over rt times the delta phi. And this is our final equation that we wanted to, or one of the final equations that you wanted to obtain. This shows the partition coefficient of any charged species, and that's the only, that, that are the species we are currently regarding, only they have this term, so to speak, that is switched on by the charge of the co corresponding, charge number of this corresponding component. The partition coefficient is the same as we have in the uncharged case, the Ki0, but then we have an access to the partition coefficient which depends on the charge of the species as well as on the electrostatic potential difference between the phases, the delta phi, which is this potential difference. Okay, of course we need to discuss that later on, but let's just stick with that, which means on the other hand side that the partition coefficient of charged species is influenced by that. What that means in the end we will discuss later when we have seen the results, so to speak, in some future videos, not in this one. Here we only want to derive the basic things, so to speak. Now we have actually seen, so we have this equation, but we can apply it now to the salts that we add to the system or that we intended to add it to the system previously. We said we want to add sodium chloride to the two-phase system. It dissociates in both phases. And then we just have uh, the partition coefficients of an anion and a cation. And we realized previously, due to electroneutrality, the concentrations of anion and cation in both phases have to be identical. So, the well, not between the phases, but in one phase, the anion concentration and the cation concentration has to be identical, and in the other uh, phase, 
and ion and cation concentration also have to be identical, which means the ratio between both is the same for both ions, for the N ion as well as for the cation. That means the partition coefficient of N ion and cation, if you just add a single salt to the system, then the, the partition coefficient of N ion and cation has to be identical. So if there is a single salt, let's call it for brevity AC, N ion and cation, for that follows that the K of the N ion has to be the same as the K of the cation. Has to be. Of course, if you want to spell it out in more detail, this is a minus and this is a, is a plus. So N ion minus and cation plus. And we can now spell that out, of course, in this case. We can apply this equation like this. And if we do that, well, what do we obtain? So partition coefficients are identical, which means, of course, also the logarithm of the partition coefficient has to be identical. So the ln of the ki minus equals the ln of the ka minus 0 minus zi, oh, well, that's, of course, the z of the n ion times the f divided by rt times the delta phi equals the ln of the kc plus which is equal to the ln of the kc plus zero minus the zc plus times f over rt. So we just applied what we had before and plugged in this equation into this equation to get these terms. I forgot, of course, something. I forgot the delta phi. This is, of course, the most important parameter in this equation. And so what we want to do now is actually we want to combine this equation and solve that for the delta phi. What happens if we do that? Okay, let's do it in two steps. So we have on the one hand side the um, um, ln k a minus zero minus ln k c plus zero equals a delta phi times z c plus f over r t is a minus sign minus the z a minus f over r t. Yeah. On the right hand side this has a minus sign, this is this one, and if we bring this term to the other side this will have a positive sign, minus times minus, so that's positive. And now we can uh, solve that, so to speak, for the delta phi equals, we realize that actually we can combine these two terms. This is an ln Ka minus 0 divided by Kc plus 0 divided by this factor. And there we actually realize the RTF is the same and then we just have the difference between the, the, the charge numbers. And if we rewrite that, we get in that way, we get an RT in the numerator divided by the Z a minus minus z c plus times the Faraday constant times the logarithm of the k a minus zero divided by the k c plus zero. And this is our second equation. And this actually expresses exactly what I've explained before in a in some visual way, because it says if N ion and cation have a difference in their natural partition behavior, if they were not charged, that's expressed by the zero. If that differs, if their partition coefficient would differ if there uh, were no electrostatic forces acting. Then take this ratio, the logarithm of that, and weight it with that factor in order to get the electrostatic potential difference between the phases. And that is well, more or less natural constants, temperature, and uh, so to speak, the charge. Well, it's, uh, of course, the, that is a negative value, that is a positive value. So overall, that gives you a 
relatively, well, for sodium chloride, this is, for example, in this case, minus 2. So just some numerical factors, so to speak, associated with the charge numbers of the corresponding species. Indeed, that means the potential difference, electrostatic potential difference, is induced by the different tendency of the ionic species to partition if they were uncharged. So that it exactly relates to, so to speak, to what we have seen. That means actually, well, what does that mean? Well, it means there is a potential difference. And you realize at the same time, um, we didn't assume anything actually about the nature of the phases. Of course, for visualization, I introduced this aqueous two-phase system, both phases being aqueous. But otherwise, we were just regarding partition coefficients and we didn't specify between which phases that actually occurs. Which means this applies to any two-phase system, to any interface that you observe. Any interface will have typically some electrostatic potential difference. Also, you realize this equation doesn't contain any uh, salt concentration. So if you add just a single salt to another otherwise non-electrostatic, non-ionic two-phase system, independent of the salt concentration, you will find that potential difference. It's independent of salt concentration. Of course, as I said, I, um, I should stress that and we will extend that, generalize that in, in the next videos. Um, if you just add a single salt and that's the only ionic species or these are the only ionic species in the system that do some electrostatics. This is quite important. At the same time, we realize, of course, well, how was it? The Poisson equation there, we didn't get any change in the electrostatic potential if the rho z was zero. And apparently, well, we get a potential difference. Where is that coming from? So the rho z, the, the net charge density, cannot be zero everywhere. And as you can show, I will show you in just a moment, actually at the interface, at a very narrow range at the interface, there is a shift of the charged species. So that induces then the, uh, the electrostatic potential difference. In order to show these things, to interpret these things, we should go back to the presentation. So that's where we left the presentation. And now, again, to introduce that for a typical case where things are written down in, in many textbooks on, on physical chemistry, for example, we have a solid-liquid equilibrium. And as I said, it doesn't matter which phases you regard it. Typically, for the solid, you assume that the surface is negatively charged. There are some and ions, so to speak, attached somehow to the interface. And if that is then in contact with a liquid, which contains a salt, which dissociates, where you have your ionic species, of course, they can freely move around. So they can move, and actually they are continuously moving quite heavily. So this is just a momentary picture of the position. And if you look close, you will, be, you will realize that actually, well, overall, you will have negative and positive ions everywhere. But because of this excess negative charge, you will have, well, some first positive ions which are absorbed to the interface, which is, well, this inner, this negative charge layer is a so-called inner Helmholtz layer. These adsorbed species are the so-called outer Helmholtz layer. And then there is nevertheless a, still a little bit a positive excess charge in the vicinity of the interface. I don't know if I can see that, so if you count in this range, so to speak, from here to here, the positive and the negative charges, there are one, two, three, four, five, six uh, positive charges and one, two, three negative charges, so there is a slight excess of positive charges, which together with the outer Helmholtz layer compensates the inner, the charge of the inner Helmholtz layer, so that overall everything is electron neutral. The bulk phase here is electroneutral as well. So we realize at the interface there is some shift of ionic species. And this is where the molecules are moving and there is a net charge effect, so to speak. That's called the diffusive double layer, so where you have a slight positive excess charges to compensate together with the outer Helmholtz layer the charge of the inner Helmholtz layer. Now if you regard liquid-liquid systems, of course, we don't have this. What we have instead is actually a combination of diffusive double layers. 
in one, on one side we have a slight positive excess of the ionic species, so more cations close to the interface. For the other side we have a slight excess of a negative, uh, of the uh, anions close to the interface. So we have a double diffuse, double layer in our system, in both liquid phases. And that is of course induced because in this case, for example, the positive ions would like to prefer to go a little bit uh, into this phase, the negative ions would prefer to go a little bit into that phase. So close to the interface they somehow manage to separate, so they push apart, so to speak, at the interface, so there they decide into which phase they go, and then electrostatics takes over so that the bulk phases are again electroneutral. Bulk phases always in equilibrium have to be electroneutral, but at interfaces you apparently have a slight shift between the, the concentration of the charged species. One can evaluate that now in a little bit more detail. I go and don't, in, don't go into the details with that. That has been published, so we can look it up if you're interested in that. What we actually did is that for a simple salt, one-to-one -one salt, we uh, assumed that we have uh, the freedom of uh, concentrations close to the interface that deviate from each other. So this is the concentrations of the anion and of the cation. And we assumed certain properties, some relative uh, dielectric uh, values for the two phases. Uh, we also assumed certain K0s, which in induce this potential difference. Um, and then actually you can ask yourself, well, if that is the case, and if we know on the one hand side, the partition coefficient of a species depends on the zero value as well as on the uh, potential difference. And this is now really regarded as a function of distance, so to speak. So we regard the potential, which is shown at the bottom here. If the potential is plotted, so to speak, as a function of distance from the interface, starting to integrate somewhere in one of the phases as, as zero. And then, so we set everything relative to that and ask ourselves if that is now a function, then of course this enters here and so the partition is a function of position as well, leading to these concentration shifts and these concentration shifts lead then to this excess charge, net charge density uh, that we have. So that's the excess charge, the rho z that we had in our previous uh, equation. So that gives this value, and if you integrate that twice according to the Poisson equation, you will wind up with this potential function across the interface. So there's a slight shift, and if you look at the dimensions, this is just some 5 or 10 nanometers of uh, the order of dimension, which depends on the salt concentration to be uh, quite um, specific about that. If you look into those things more, the vehicle theory, it's correlated with the, or related to the Debye length, that these things occur, so to speak, different story, thermodynamics. Uh, and so if you have this small, short distance, so to speak, from the interface, there is a shift from one electrostatic potential of one phase to the other, and that's in induced by this shift of ionic species against each other, slight shift in the concentrations, leading to this overall net charge density not being exactly zero close to the interface, but only in a very close region. And that then gives a consistent picture. The bulk phases, there you see the lines are on top of each other, bulk phases are electroneutral. You have a potential difference between the two phases because there is this shift in the vicinity of the interface. And that's of course induced by how the molecules, so to speak, decide at the interface where they want to go, which is again induced by this K zero, the hypothetical partition coefficient that describes how the uh, molecule or how the species would um, partition if there were no influence of this electrostatic potential. So that gives a quite consistent picture. With that we can summarize what we have learned. Every interface has an electrostatic potential difference independent of the nature of the phases. So you can expect it for solid liquid liquid, liquid, liquid vapor phases. So also bubbles are affected in liquid, are affected by that in the end. And this is also independent of salt concentration, at least if there is a single salt present that constitutes all this electrostatic business, so to speak. Only in that case that is so. We will generalize that in the next videos. With that I would like to say thank you and I would hope that I see you again in the next videos.